Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have Pastor Greg Moselle uh, speaking to us about breaking barriers. Uh, the reference verse is Acts chapter 16, uh, verses 13 to 34. Let's welcome Pastor Greg. Great to be back with ACCC, those of you who are in the house and those who are uh, online this morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. <clears throat> Pentecost um, was a harvest celebration among the Hebrew people. And it was one of three pilgrimage festivals where people from many different uh, nations and languages and cultures would gather in Jerusalem uh, to thank God for the harvest. A matter of fact, the Jewish historian Josephus shares that as many as a million and a half people had gathered in uh, Jerusalem. I think it's probably a little bit inflated. You know, he, he's writing the glory of the Jewish people. But the, let's say hundreds of thousands of people have all gathered in Jerusalem for a harvest. And at this Pentecost, there was a harvest they never could have imagined. Because it's at that strategic moment where people have gathered from many nations and cultures and languages that God pours out the Holy Spirit. And at least 3,000 people uh, give their lives to Christ, and they're baptized with many more following. And then they would go back home and begin to take with them uh, their experience of the gospel and their new devotion to Christ. And so the gospel begins to break through all kinds of barriers, geographic barriers, national barriers, ethnic barriers, socioeconomic. I mean, every barrier that our world erects, the gospel is smashing along with the barrier between us and God, the spiritual barrier that we all need broken. <clears throat> so this morning's message as we look at breaking barriers, it, um, a, a little bit along the way of the gospel spreading, we come to Acts chapter 16 and this amazing scene that happens in the city of Philippi. So if you want to join in your Bibles or queue up your device to Acts chapter 16. That'll be really helpful as we kind of fly over this passage. And we're going to explore the lives of three different people. Now, in Philippi, we learned that there were a, a lot of people who gave their lives to Christ. But the author of Acts, Luke, chooses to profile three of these people. And it isn't random. It's, it's like out of all these people whose lives were touched by the gospel, Luke chooses three. <clears throat> because they're three of the most startlingly diverse people you could ever imagine. Uh, one of them is a wealthy businesswoman. Then there's a little slave girl. And then there's a prison guard. Let's just see how diverse they are and how the gospel's breaking barriers and what that means in our own lives. <clears throat> we'll look at five different barriers that are broken down in um, while this mission team, Paul and Silas, are in Philippi. And the first of those is ethnic barriers. Now, we're introduced to the first character, Lydia, in verse 14, and we learn that she's from Thyatira. Thyatira was in uh, the Roman province of Asia. So from the Roman mind, she was Asian. She was probably either Asian or Middle Eastern, but in, but in the, the empire's construct, she was Asian. Then we have this little slave girl. We meet her in verse 16 and on. She's probably local, <clears throat> and the reason is there was a glut on the market, tragically, for slaves in the Roman Empire. Matter of fact, kind of a, a phrase among the empire was that there's such a glut on the market for slaves that you could buy a slave for about the price of a loaf of bread. And so that means transporting slaves was incredibly expensive. <clears throat> so she's probably local. She's probably a little Greek <clears throat> girl. And the next is the jailer, the prison guard. We meet him in verse 23 and then on. <clears throat> he works for the government. Now, Philippi was a Roman colony, and so this was uh, the empire's jail. The vast majority of civil servants in the Roman Empire were retired military. Uh, after serving 20 years, if you survived, then you had the opportunity to have a civil servant job without taxation, all right? And so <clears throat> he's Roman. Then we have Paul and Silas who meet these different people, and they're Jewish Christian missionaries. So they're Jewish people from Israel. Think about this, a Roman or at least Middle Eastern, a Greek, a Roman, and Jewish 
from the nation of Israel. Oh, thank you. Could you detail my car too while over here, Noel? <laughs> thank you, Noel. Uh, thank you, uh, Noel. You, all that you do behind the scenes to make this English language um, worship service possible is really beautiful. So grateful. <clears throat> so the barriers already, barriers of racism, of nationalism, and elitism are already being smashed and broken through. The next of the barriers that's broken is the social diversity of these three people. Lydia, we note in verse 14, was a merchant of purple cloth. Now, that's not necessarily just, oh, she sold this color cloth. Purple cloth was, was known throughout the empire, and it was um, from the extract of the root of a plant that was some of the most vibrant color, and it was also a permanent dye. So when you heard you know, purple cloth, it might be kind of like saying an Armani suit today, you know, something like that, or Saks Fifth Avenue, whatever it is. In other words, <clears throat> she is probably a fashion designer, and she's selling some of the most high-end uh, fashion or fabric in order to do that. In other words, she's a successful businesswoman. She's a wealthy woman. <clears throat> and not only that, but she's from Thyatira, which was one of the three largest textile exporters of the Roman Empire. Philippi also had a huge clothing guild. So we can surmise, we don't know for sure, but she probably traveled from Thyatira to Philippi on a business trip. And then we also read that she had a house. She has a house in Philippi, but she lives in Thyatira. This is a woman with at least one, probably two houses large enough to host this uh, a mission team. So this is a, a, a wealthy woman. Then you have the slave girl. In verse 16, we learn that she's been exploited. She's been trafficked. She's been used in order to make money for other people. I wonder what her story is. Wouldn't it be great if, if Luke would have footnoted and said, by the way, let me tell you this little girl's story. I wonder how she was enslaved. I wonder how she'd been abused. I wonder how she'd been used. What about the spiritual oppression that she's experiencing. Our world is filled with little girls and boys and men and women like this who are enslaved to all kinds of different things. See, these people who we're reading about, they live among us today. They just have different stories and different nationalities, different socioeconomics and different stories. <clears throat> uh, so she is as poor as you can get, and she's socially marginalized. So we have a wealthy woman, a poor girl, and now we have the prison guard, uh, Philippi, a Roman colony. He's probably retired military. He's got a government job. He's as close as the empire could give us to a middle-class person. Wealthy woman, poor girl, middle-class guy. And then we have generational differences. Lydia is probably an older one, at least middle-aged, probably an older woman. She owns a business. She owns at least one, probably two homes. Uh, she has a family. So she's middle age or, or probably an older woman to have accomplished this at that time. Well, the slave girl, of course, is a little girl, but uh, the word girl in the, in the Greek text, because remember that the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. We translate it to the languages of the world. The word girl is translated from a form of paideia. It's, it's paideiskon. It's a girl before marrying age. Now, in our culture, like, oh, she's probably younger than about 28, huh? But in the ancient world, it means she's probably younger than 12, 13, or 14. Who knows? Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. This is a little girl. <clears throat> so we have this amazing mosaic happening. Wealthy woman, a poor slave, and a blue-collar guy. And yet God's going to call them all together into this mosaic of, I don't know, First Church Philippi, Right? See, God's breaking barriers and bringing together a mosaic of people who the power when people who normally wouldn't sit in the same room together because of their ethnicity or their socioeconomics or their politics or a myriad of other things that divide people. But the gospel knits us together with a higher unity than those things. And when there are diverse people who love each other and love their neighbors, that is a powerful witness of God's reconciling grace 
for each other and for our world to see. Um, and so, uh, so then the so so we have ethnic diversity, social diversity, generational diversity, and then kind of obvious gender diversity. But there's a powerful point. You see, Lydia's a woman. The slave's a girl. The jailer's a man. But here's what's fascinating in the context. Let's remember, in the Roman and Greek mystery religions, in 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 the milieu of the empire, women had no access to temples or to most of the religious practices. Matter of fact, probably four years ago, five or five years ago, um, when I was following the footsteps of Paul in what's today Turkey, you know, um, ancient Roman uh, province of Asia, we were at the temple of Zeus, okay? The temple of Zeus is not looking very good these days, okay? But the temple of Zeus, there's still some of the edifice and some of an altar. And so our leader, seminary professor, <clears throat> was walking us uh, through as if we had come to worship Zeus. We hadn't, but as if, you know, what would that be like, okay? And when we came to the entrance, he just said, stop here. All the women in the ancient world, you'd have to stop here. This didn't go over real well with our group, okay? Because the women were seminary professors and Christian authors and, and other uh, Christian leaders, okay? It, it, it was a tour of, of Christian leaders, uh, but that's what it was like. And then along comes the Christian faith. And the Christian faith says, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your gender, whatever your socioeconomics, however the culture might view you, in Christ, when we come to choose to follow Christ, we're united together. There are no barriers. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil to the temple was torn asunder, and God's spirit lives within every Christ follower, no matter who we are, what our background, whatever that might be. So this is actually pretty significant that we have these uh, this 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 gender diversity, and then finally, last of the kind of um, different startling differences is the spiritual pathways that each of them took to come to the gospel. For Lydia, it was really intellect that moved to her heart. She had questions. We know this because she's searching. In verse thirteen, she goes to a place of prayer. That's that's a a, a phrase that meant a place where people would go to be spiritually searching. It was often marginalized people who couldn't go into temples or who'd been, you know, whatever. So it was a place where you'd go and there'd be different speakers and different, and you would wrestle with, try to discern what it meant. It drew a lot of what were called God fears, people who weren't Jewish, but they believed that there was one God and they wanted to know who this God was. And here's what's amazing. We know that this place of prayer was along the Gangetes River from Philippi. It's a mile and a third. Lydia, this wealthy woman, walked a mile and a third, who knows, every weekend, we don't know, walked a mile and a third to seek after God. That really kind of convicts me. Would we walk a mile and a third to worship God or to seek after who God really is? We have a tough enough time coming to church or getting online or, or being part of a Bible study or, or reading our Bibles or praying, right? That's what she's doing. It's also fascinating because this is a woman who has a lot in the ancient world. She's wealthy. She, she, she has status. She's a fashion designer. But there's something in her life missing. And so she's searching. And here's what's fascinating. In verse 14, it says, the Lord opened her heart. I think it's a good translation. I mean, how can I actually one of, one of, the, the new, one of the two New Testament translating uh, editors was our tour leader in Turkey. So how can I argue with him, right? But um, so open her heart is good because ultimately it changed her heart. But it's fascinating because the word heart is really the Greek word proziko and the Greek and Latin, it comes into the English language, Prozac. It's the mind. Literal translation would say, the Lord opened her mind. I think heart's a good translation because it, it had to move from mind to her heart for her will, right? To change. But See, she's a woman who has questions and she's wrestling, got opened her mind and changed her heart. Maybe you have questions and you wonder, is it safe to ask these questions? Church should be the safest place. I know ACC has this culture, the safest place on earth to wrestle with who Jesus is, to ask those questions, to, to discern who Jesus really is. And we all have neighbors are wrestling to know what is Christian faith is so what I see in the media really what Christianity is and 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 how how can you believe the Bible and 
wait a minute, hey, you believe there's one God? In, you, you have intellect, you have education, you have a, a, a career and you believe this stuff? How can that fit, right? We have a lot of neighbors and people who we share life with who are like Lydia asking questions. Look at her response, it's so beautiful. She believed, she was baptized, meaning she publicly proclaimed, this is what just happened to me. Christ has changed my life. Then she begins to share with her family. Then she begins to steward her wealth. She hosts the mission team at her home. And I wonder in the years to come how she would steward her wealth. Isn't that awesome? Lydia is a great example for us. She believed. First of all, she searched and God met her. And she believed, she was baptized. She shared with her family and then she stewarded her resources. Um, I serve on an advisory board for an organization called Vision New England. And I'm also working as a consultant through them with Gordon Conwell Seminary and a theme this year for Vision New England. Um, I didn't come up with this. I just, I just celebrated it is to disadvantage ourselves for the gospel. Because if we don't disadvantage ourselves, if we don't serve others at some kind of sacrifice, how are people going to see who Jesus is, who sacrificed himself to redeem us? See, the days of people gathering in a stadium to hear information, give their life to Christ. There, there's some people like that, but most people are going to say, what, what, what are you talking about? They need to see the gospel lived out. They need to see Jesus incarnated in acts of love and care and, and compassion and love and relationship, disadvantaging ourselves in order to serve and love our neighbors. It's easier to preach than it is to live out, isn't it? It's a lifelong journey. So <clears throat> for Lydia, it's really intellect questions she's wrestling. Now for the slave girl, her spiritual path was very different. She's reached because she was cared for in crisis. And she was in a tremendous crisis. In verse 16, we read, she's spiritually oppressed. She's been trafficked as a slave. She's socially marginalized. She's desperate. Here's how desperate she is. She follows the mission team around. In verse 17, she follows them around, shouting to them, shouting and shouting and shouting day after day after day. She's desperate. We live in a world with desperate little girls and little boys and men and women like this, waiting to be liberated from whatever's enslaved them. Rather that be poverty, rather it be the different isms of our culture, or rather it be from addiction or loneliness or grief or spiritual emptiness. He's waiting for God's people to reach them. Um, and so Lydia, kind of her intellectual questions, the slave girl, it's, she's cared for in crisis and it liberates her, the jailer, the prison guard, it's through the example of Paul and Silas, someone else's witness, their example. Because Paul and Silas really suffer here. here. Here's their suffering. In verse 20 and 21, they experience racial hatred. Verse 22, mob violence. Verse 22, you know, continuing, they're stripped naked. And let's remember, uh, in Hebrew culture, to be stripped naked is one of the greatest humiliations you can experience. Um, and then we read in verse 23 that they're flogged, severely flogged. Their backs are bruised and bloody and, and, and stripped. And, and then in verse 24, they're put in stocks. They've been humiliated and tortured. We don't know why, but I wonder through all of this, why Paul didn't just pull out and say, I'm a Roman citizen. It would have stopped it. He doesn't do that. I don't know why. I'm guessing, okay, this is thus wonder Greg and not thus saith Lord. I wonder if you realize, you know, God's doing something through this. I think all this is where this disadvantaging ourselves is worth it because God's doing something and we, we have a sense of that. So we're, we're going to suffer some because it, something's coming. So that's all that they go through. Okay. Humiliated, tortured. And how do they respond? Do this. I can't wait to take revenge. My rights have been breached. We're going to hire an attorney. That's not what they do. Here's what's amazing. In verse 25, they're praying and singing hymns to God. They're worshiping. And the other prisoners are listening to them. We're amazing. Would I worship Jesus? Would I continue to worship Jesus when there's adversity in my life? They're on a worship celebration in the middle of the night in prison. And then when 
when an earthquake comes and, and everyone can flee and the prison guard says, I'm suiciding because my prisoners, uh, um, I've lost them. And instead of saying, oh, hey, I'll say, let's watch this man. This is the guy who did this to us. They say, wait a minute, don't kill yourself. You're valuable in God's sight. Please don't kill yourself. What a witness for this guy. What an example of Christ's likeness for this guy. And how does he respond? Well, first he says, what, what do I need to do to be saved? What he's re really saying is, how can I have what you guys have? Because I, I, I was going to, I was going to kill myself and you guys have life. There's, there's something about you guys. It's their example, their witness, even in adversity. And how does the jailer respond? The prison guard in verse 33, he washes their wounds, the wounds that he inflicted. He's now washing them. And then he takes them home in verse 34 and feeds them dinner. And then he and his family are baptized and his life has changed. What a mosaic of people coming to Christ. Barriers broken. For Lydia, it's the intellect, her questions. For this little slave girl, she's been cared for in a crisis. And then for the jailer, he sees the example of Christ followers who are faithful even when they're suffering. I wonder who there is in our lives because these people live in our community today. They have different names and backgrounds and whatever, but there's Lydia's and there's those, there's those who have a lot, but they're really empty inside. There are those who are enslaved by all kinds of things. And there's, and there's people who just wonder, is life even worth living anymore? And who is it that we can help with their questions to come alongside and just help with their questions? Give them freedom to ask those difficult questions. Yesterday, I was at a, a Gordon Conwell Seminary training event uh, with the consulting work I do, nine, nine churches, you know, a whole day of training. And, and one of the Gordon Conwell professors talked about back in the day when he um, was doing prison ministry. Uh, and then they were also doing campus ministry. And the campus ministry last two chaplains had both fooled around with students. And so the campus ministry was just almost dissolved. And they went to a dorm and they went every room, this back in like the 1970s, I guess you could do that back then, right? And, and, and they just said, if you have any questions about spirituality or Christianity without judgment, we just want to have a space to talk about that. They wondered if anybody would come. They said the room was full. There were, there were people sitting in the windows on the floor. When people know it's safe to wrestle with, their, it's amazing what will ooze out of them. Or maybe for some of our neighbors, we realize that they're in crisis and we slow down and we just, just care about them. We minister to them. We, we mow their yard or we make a meal or we just let them know, are you okay? You know, we, we care for those around us, whether it's our neighbors or through church ministries or missions. And for others, it's, it's our witness, even when there's adversity, even in the way we, we should respond in a way, and we might have a worldly right to respond, but instead we're grace giving. Imagine the difference that that can make. Wealthy woman, slave girl, prison guard, and yet they're all brought together in this mosaic that's called the church. You know, this, this community is a, is a Pentecost village, all kinds of people. And when we're united in Christ, what an amazing witness of God's reconciling grace to each other and to our community. And all of this has been brought to us by our savior who broke barriers. Now imagine with me, this is just imaginary, but it brings the, so I wanna make sure that you know that. It, it's like the Trinity sitting around the Trinitarian table in eternity. And they're, wow, you know, look at humanity, how far they're, they're gonna go astray. And Jesus raises his hand, he said, I'll go. I'll go show them who we are. I'll go show them how much we love them. I will sacrifice the glory, the honor, the privilege, the comfort of, of heaven. And I mean, we're looking forward someday to going the other way to the perfectly restored creation. Jesus left it to become one of us. 
And on the cross, he sacrificed his life to break barriers between us, to reconcile us back with our heavenly father. And then to help us to break barriers as a witness of the gospel for all peoples. Amen. Father, we give you thanks on this Pentecost Sunday. It's like, it's like the rhythm of our liturgical calendar of Christmas, the incarnation that you became one of us. And then Good Friday, which was not so good Friday for you, Jesus. That's the crucifixion where our sins could be hoisted on the cross and we could be forgiven. And then comes Easter, the resurrection that, that gives us the hope of, of eternal life. That we have an internal inheritance beyond what we can imagine. And then Pentecost, which is mission. You've called us to be your hands and feet and voice as your Holy Spirit equips us and empowers us. God, I thank you for ACCC, for their journey, for the years we shared together in the same church building, for, for your call for them to, to plant in this area, in this building. But we know that ACC is not a building. It's faithful people, people who are marvels of God's grace. Would you continue to bless this church family? to love each other as Jesus loves, to forgive each other as Jesus forgives, to hold each other accountable as you, Spirit, hold us accountable, and to be a witness to each other and their neighbors of the beauty of Christ. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with, with enormous gratitude. Amen.